Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Right. So today I'm going to present about my PhD project, which is regarding an inducible hypermutator. So I just want to give you some background about the bacteria that I'm, uh, that I'm investigating in my PhD. So it's about Pseudomonas aeruginosa. In, in case you don't know, it is actually a versatile gram-negative bacteria which is widely available in a whole range of environments. For example, you can find it from the soil, from the water, or sometimes you can even find it on the skin. But it won't cause a huge problem to a healthy people like us. But for those uh, immunocompromised patients, then you need to watch out because it will cause some very, very um, nasty effects to, you, to your body. For example, look at this. This is a patient with diabetes. So it will cause, a, you, know, you can see this green slimy thing on it. It is actually caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa and it is not guacamole, right? <laughs> and this is the patient with bacterial keratitis with a green eye. It is caused by the Pseudomonas aeruginosa as well. And this is not the eye of the buttercup. <laughs> so just want to give you some hint about the Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is a green bacteria, which is quite nasty. So it is quite... Uh, it's kind of like an opportunistic um, bacteria or pathogens, especially also for those cystic fibrosis patients as well. It will grow happily in the airway in, of their lung, okay? And it will it, it actually catch the attention of the scientists because it has increasingly um, prevalence of the multi-drug resistance. So which means it's really hard to be cured. And what makes... Uh, the things even worse is that when these bacteria start to hypermutate, which means it actually um, has the mutation rate more than 100 times as, as we compare to the wild type. And why is it so? It is because there is a defect in the mismatch repair mechanism, which actually comprises of some of the enzymes or what we call the proteins. For example, like the MAD S, as, as I state over here, the MAD S, MAD L. So they are actually like a policeman, you know, doing a surveillance and a proofreading or the quality control after the DNA replication. Whenever there is a mismatch occur, then the MAD S will start to detect and then it will recruit the MAD L over there and then they start to do the downstream process to remove the erroneous part of it and then replace with the correct, uh, the correct version of the nascent strand of the DNA. However, if you can see, if the normal policeman has a defect over there, then what will happen is the RNA strand or the mismatch in the DNA cannot be fixed, cannot be repaired. And what will happen is the mutation occur, and that's why it causes a lot of different phenotypes of, uh, appear from a plate when we culture the hypermutator. The big colonies, small colonies, and some of them are actually also involved in a pathoadaptation, for example, like the antimicrobial resistance and also the, some of the virulence and so on. So in this project, we're trying to um, exploit the mud S over here so that we can try to control the rate of mutation of this particular bacteria by actually introduce a switch so that I can actually control rheostatically okay, on the mud S expression, which will also, um, next step is to control the rate of mutation itself. So when there is a inner chemical inducer like Ramnose over here, if, if there is a, a no presence of Ramnose, then it will start, keep hypermutate because no amount has to do the proofreading, right? But if there is a presence of Ramnose, then it can start to behave like a wild type or, if possible, to behave like a hypomutator which never be reported before. So it's kind of like a step on the evolutionary paddle or the break of the bacteria. So what I did, so it, it was like I have, I have a normal wild type strain of the Pseudomonas aeruginosa and I introduced the system in whereby you can see there is a promoter uh, control, tightly controlled by the Ramnose and it will keep expressing the mud S in the presence of Ramnose. And then afterwards, I, I actually delete the endogenous mud S, which is the original mud S encoded by the mud, uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa itself and uh, which is under the presence of Ramnos, so that under the presence of Ramnos, we have a lot, we have enormous amount of exogenous mud S being expressed so that we can actually maintain the integrity while I'm deleting the original mud S from the bacteria. All right, so by doing so, by doing in this order, I can actually try to avoid any collateral damage 
from the genome before I introduce the system into the bacteria so that I can try to maintain its wild type uh, um, genotype. So before this, I'm also going to make sure that the ramnose I'm using is not metabolized by the bacteria, otherwise it's quite useless, right? So when I grow them on the glucose, they're growing happily, but on the ramnose plate and without any carbon sources, they're not able to grow. And when I do the XTTSA as well, as you can see over here, there is no difference at all uh, between no carbon and ramnose and glucose, they can grow happily, so which means that they, they cannot metabolize the ramnose, so which means the ramnose is a really good uh, inner chemical inducer. So right now, I have my model here, but how can I actually assay the hypermutability? How can I actually measure the mutation frequency? So right now, we have a very good um, proxy to measure the mutant frequency, which is by using the rifampicin, because rifampicin is actually targeting on the RNA polymerase, which is also encoded by RKO A, B, or C in the bacteria genome. So, in the normal case, RKO A, or B, or C, in the normal case, they have a normal RNA polymerase, they can do the transcription. And in the presence of the rifampicin, it will bind to it, then no transcription, no protein synthesis, and the, protein, uh, and the bacteria will die. All right. However, if there is any hypermutation, then accidentally also luckily happen in the site of RPOA or B or C, then the structure of the RNA polymerase changed, and then the rifampicin cannot bind successfully. Then what will happen is the transcription occur, protein synthesis happen, and the bacteria can grow happily on my rifampicin plate. So, looking at this, for my hypermutability assay, when I increase the amount of ramnose, the mutant frequency decreases because there are more mass expression, right? So, I can actually suppress the hypermut uh, hypermutation so that my bacteria can behave like a wild type so that I'm not able to grow happily on the rifampicin plate. And when we not only looking at the plate itself, when we try to do the Western blot to see the amount of mass expression, Okay, it can, we can see that actually by using these, we can successfully even control the mass amount um, actually expressed in the particular bacteria. So I would say this is quite successful. And this is another, also another thing which is quite interesting because we are also quite interested to know if we are able to achieve hypomutation, which never been happened before, uh, reported before, which has the um, lower mutation rate or mutant frequency than the wild type. And when we actually extend our uh, remnos, sorry, uh, remnos concentration up to 50 millimolar, we can see that the mutation rate or mutation frequency drops significantly as compared to the wild type. So which means we can even achieve that hypomutation. So right now we have this very useful model, but can we actually try to maintain the integrity even after several passage? So this is quite interesting questions. Then uh, what I did is I pick a single colony, I split into half. Half of it will go to those plates without any ramnos to 10 passages. And then the rest, uh, the, the other half to those plates with the ramnos. Okay. So as you can see over there at the very uh, last passage, which is passage number 10, I pick a single colony and then I grew under presence of ramnos to stop the mutation. And then I uh, extract the gDNA and send for whole genome sequencing. And as you can see over here, the agar over here I'm using right now is the ASM agar, or what we call the artificial sputum medium, which mimics the CF airway so that actually we can try to investigate how it behaves like um, in the CF lungs. So based on the result from a whole genome sequencing, you can see the blue line over here is the one with the presence of remnos. You can see the mutation rise is really low, only one or two dots over there. Or yeah, or th three, okay. But if you look at the red one, it's, which is the one without ramnos, it just hypermutate happily. So which means even after several passages, we are able to control the uh, hypermutation um, in this case, even in the CF airways as well. And based on the mutation type as well, we have the transition. Uh, as the majority of the mutation type, which is also reported before, and also the missense mutation, which might be one of the causes that caused a pathoadaptative mutation uh, in the CF airways. So we now have the very good tool right now, but in order to study this further, 
with the help of Eva, okay, so we actually start to establish this, which um, done by our previous PhD student in our lab. This system is actually trying to mimic a CF lung, CF airways, okay? So by using this, we can start to see what is the interspecies interaction and intraspecies interaction of this bacteria with others and what will happen. Can it actually alter the evolutionary trajectory of this bacteria in a, a CF airways? So based on the result, we can see that when we grow the hypermutator with Staph aureus together, hypermutator is quite strong even after we add the colistin in to kill the Pseudomonas aeruginosa. But if it is hypomutator, it is quite weak, okay? So it is quite weak, so, so when we add the colistin, it drops. All right, so when we look at this, this is the interspecies interaction. How about intraspecies competition? When we grow the wall type together with the uh, hyper or hypomutator, what will happen? So we can see over here the cholestin addition after we add it. Uh, so before this, they grow happily, like almost equally, almost balanced. But the hypermutator is still quite strong after the cholestin of, uh, addition of cholestin. And um, for the hypomutator, it is still quite weak. Okay, weak, as weak as the wild type. So, which means this system is quite successful and we can actually try to use this, for example, in a drug discovery. All right, so that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for it. I'm looking for, for some questions. Ah, yes. Is this an approach that would be useful in other bacteria? I mean, you, you've got something that you can control quite easily, it would seem. Yeah, so actually MARS is encoded in a lot of bacteria as well, even our human cells. So if we actually uh, can um, delete the MARS gene in that particular bacteria, we can uh, control by using this way. But another thing we're gonna see is that if that other bacteria uh, it is metabolizing the particular remnants or any other sugar. If it is, then we're going to you know, uh, find another alternative to substitute the remnants. But yeah, the theory is still the same. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. I'm looking for some other questions. Mm, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, yes. My eyes are not the best today. So if it's the same in humans, could you potentially use this to like reduce the amount of cancerous mutations in people? Um, well, probably, I'm not sure, okay. Um, probably we can try, but yeah, I think, but if that's the case, probably the person gonna like, injecting the remnants like, every day in order to control the rate of mutation. But yeah, I think this is the very good you know, area to study. Yep, thank you very much. Thank you. There is a time for a very quick one if someone has it. If not, I just would like to say thank you for the presentation.